and invisible and type away. And just yeah, so and we're going to wait for a couple parents to show up, <laughs> yeah, which is perfect. And if they don't, then we just move forward and I review your PowerPoint and I discuss how prepared you were and everything. And we move forward from there and you'll get an email probably from the evaluation system. All right. Thank okay. you. Hello. We're going to get started Hi. in just a minute. Okay. Thanks. You can turn off your camera and mute uh, while we're presenting. It might give you better Wi-Fi. It, it makes me feel better. Yeah, I'm trying to, to find <laughs> some reason it's not letting me. There we go. Oh, just so you know, this meeting is being recorded. I have it, Marta. I'll, I'll just do it. And it will be available um, at a later time on the transition site. Do you wanna wait like one more minute, Marta, and then let's get started? All right, uh, thank you for joining us. We appreciate your attendance. Self-advocacy for students with disabilities, I am Lacey Roberts, and I am presenting tonight with Marta Mullen, and we are hoping to bring some awareness to self-advocacy and how you can help. Please be reminded that this is a recorded session. You will benefit from having your camera off as well as your sound off while we're presenting because it'll give you better connections to the things that we're presenting. We do have a video toward the end and then we will have some question and answer after that. So please be mindful that after the video um, on self-advocacy, you will be able to ask questions. So this is what we're gonna kind of go through tonight, kind of like an agenda. We're gonna define self-advocacy. We're gonna explain why it's important to you and your student. We're gonna talk about how it relates to students' IEPs. We're also gonna talk about you and how you can help us work together as a team to make this better for your student. Uh, we're also gonna provide you some resources and some really great um, conversation starters for families. So self-advocacy is when students or people know their rights and responsibilities. They're able to speak up for their rights and they're able to make choices and decisions that affect their life. The goal of self-advocacy is for someone to decide what they want and then develop or carry out a plan that helps them achieve what it is they're trying to achieve. It's important for many reasons. Some of the ones that we found were that it gives teenagers a feeling of being in control. It gives them the ability to communicate their needs to others. It helps them to understand others' needs and learn to problem solve and develop their relationship with their self. And it also fosters healthy relationships and words like empowered come to mind when we think of self-advocacy. I do apologize if you hear any noise in the background. I have a cat that has just discovered birds outside the window, so I, I humbly apologize for that. Um, Self-advocacy, the research, uh, I am really steeped in research lately, so I feel like it's important to give you those that are really doing the heavy work. So this page, uh, which will be available on the website as well, the links that are down in the bottom to the right are to the actual journal articles of um, self-advocacy, and they go in depth on um, different people's research projects around this topic. If you're interested some more, you can check that out. Um, we do know that self-advocacy is linked to higher GPA and increased graduation rates. It's considered to be essential um, in overall success of students with disabilities in colleges. And all of those people listed there said it um, many times in many ways. So the other big takeaway is that it's um, 
that self-advocacy supports a perceived acceptance and connection to the community. So people that feel like they're more accepted in their community or connected to their community have higher levels of self-advocacy. What we want you to remember is that self-advocacy takes lots of time, lots of practice. They're going to need encouragement. It's going to feel a little weird. It's going to take time. It's not linear. We don't want you to think of self-advocacy as, as a one-stop shop. Oh, yes, we taught them self-advocacy in sixth grade and they're done. No, that's not how this works. We want you to think about it as a continuum where they can slide up and they can slide back depending on what we're talking about. If we're talking about health, they might be really great at telling a doctor, this is what's wrong with me. My nose is running, my ears hurt, whatever. But then when you start to talk about going to the grocery store and they have to buy something from the counter. We have lots of students that really struggle with that when it comes to self-advocacy and counting their money and 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 saying something or speaking up if if the product that they're purchasing is broken or if say they didn't get the correct change. So you're going to have to be positive, talk through difficulties that are going to arise with your kids and model self-advocacy in positive ways. Super important. In schools, Marta, do you want to take this one? Yeah, I'll go ahead and take this one. Um, so inside of the schools, there's a number of things that we practice self-advocacy and there's a number of things that we do that are part of both the IEP and some other things. So first off, we really want them to understand their disability. That's one of the reasons that we invite students to the IEP team. Yes, it is part of IDEA and saying that they absolutely need to be there for the team, but we want them to participate. The first questions that we are doing are asking them, tell us a little bit about how this is going. We want some information and we want to be able to include them as far as understanding it. There are times when a parent or student may say, hey, I don't want to be here. That is self-advocating for themselves. They're saying, this is not something that I want to do. Maybe I need to be in class because I have a test. Maybe I have something else that's going on that's going to take priority. That is a student who has given some information and then shared that information back to us to say, hey, I understand that this is important, but I need to go take this test right now. And that's my priority. We want them to ask if they don't understand something or if it's not clear to them, we absolutely want them to be able to ask questions to raise their hand. Um, they should also be familiar with the IEP. They need to understand it is about them and they should be able to identify what their familiar supports are. If they have extended time, they should understand what extended time means. So if we say you have time and a half and there's an hour for the test and they are not finished at the end of that hour, that extra 90 minutes is something that, or that extra 30 minutes to bring it up to 90 is absolutely something they are entitled to, right? But sometimes they might need to say, hey, I'm not done yet. Can I have extended time? There are a lot of times when students may take the test in a separate location. Maybe they don't want to. We will document when students do those things, but we want to be able to make sure that they are using their accommodations and that they are familiar with the supports and why they are there. I've been in teams too when kids have said, oh, that's not something I use. I will never use that. I'm not going to use that. Or I don't use that anymore. I don't need that. That's them telling us what they have mastered and what they don't feel, feel like they're going to continue to need, okay? It is time to have that courageous conversation with them about what works and what does not work. There are times when a kid is just gonna sit there and say, this is what you're telling me and I'm listening to you, but I'm not necessarily going to ever use that. I would rather have a child say to me in the meeting, hey, you know, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm not going to go into a separate location to take that test. Well, if you're not going to do it here, you may not do it in college either. So that means that you're going to end up having to follow along with what the expectations are in that classroom. If the extended time was in a, was in a slightly different location, then that might be something you need to be aware of. Okay, But figure out with them what works. Make plans. Discuss things with them. 
um, attending the IEP team, yes, we are absolutely required by law to invite any student who is having their transition IEP. We start the year that they are 13 at the beginning of their IEP because they're going to turn 14 during that school year. Okay, so as far as the IEP goes, that's where we're looking at this. There are other things that we would like them to do, such as joining clubs. You know, kids tell me that they want to be a, they're gonna be a YouTuber. And I'm like, okay, is there an art and media club in there? Is there a video game club? Join a club. I want to see that you are involved in things. If you tell me you want to play football, if you want to play a sport, you're going to be an athlete. I expect you to be involved in the sports through the school. That means maintaining those grades that belong in it, that following the rules, making making um, relationships happen with the coaches and your peers that are also playing those same things. Um, we want our students to learn about positive decision making and we want them to be able to say this is what works for me and i want to be able to have you use it in school and see it consistently okay everybody knows that some of our kids are not up for trying some of the new experiences and figuring out what you like or do not like but this is a perfect time to do it you are in a safe space. We know that if you don't do, if you're not meeting with success with something while you're in the public school in the high school setting, or even in the middle school setting, we're going to work with you on it. We're going to find out what it is, and we're going to be able to assist you with it. Now is the time to make some of those challenges and try different things. But just remember, be gentle with yourself, and then offer other people the same kind of grace. Partially because we learn from our mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. I do things wrong several times. And then by the time I've learned it, I've made that mistake so many times, I can tell you about why I made the mistake even. Okay. Another thing to point out here, just like Marta said, um, have students ask for clarity. This also applies to assignments. I am finding a lot of students have a fear or an anxiety related to speaking to their teachers in the classroom and finding out, you know, how they can improve their grade or whatever the circumstances with a particular assignment. I would encourage you as parents to advocate and have conversations with your student to Stand behind them, have them write an email to that teacher just to get the conversation going. With you right there, you might be able to help guide them with some, some key words so that the teacher can understand what's happening, but it still opens that door of communication. That's, and that's a perfect point because they have a way to message each of their teachers in Schoology. So by going into the Schoology, parents, we should be familiar with how to use Schoology, what we look at inside of there, and then having that conversation about what does this look like with our kids while, while they are going through things so that they can see where are your struggles, analyze some of this stuff with them, okay? So the law. Transition services are a coordinated set of activities for a student with a disability that is designed to be results oriented. It's focused to improve their academic and their functional achievement and their ability to facilitate movement from school to post school activities. This includes post secondary education vocational ed education, integrated or supported employment, continuing and adult education, adult services, independent living, or community participation. So this is what IDEA, the law, says we must um, support for our students. So how do we get them started? How do we get them talking about what they want to be when they grow up? Well, each student meets with their case manager, their case manager annually, and they go through a series of questions. From year to year, for some students, these questions on your screen remain the same. They knew since they were in second grade they wanted to be a teacher, and, and all of their questions and answers typically remain very similar. Whereas other kids, 
don't have any idea what they want to do, or they they switch from career path to career path. That's very typical. But we wanted you to see the kinds of questions that we're asking of your students to help them start to think about their future and what it looks like to them. Yeah, and when we report this information is on the IEP, the answers are a part of that IEP. So when we're looking at a section of the IEP called the preferences and interests or the PLOF page, we put this information in there partially because we want you to see that this is what your child is working towards. Uh, and sometimes some kids change it every year. Some kids keep it the same year. So there's a lot of different pieces that go into that on that. Sometimes kids don't even know what their favorites are. Sometimes they aren't sure what they're relaxing. We hear a lot of kids who have a hobby of sleeping and there's different pieces to that. And I think that's really one of those things where they're saying to us, yeah, it's just exhausting to go to school. So what else do you do besides that? What are you doing outside of that? So sometimes we'll need to prompt them and ask a few more questions. Kind of, we call it probing them to ask the questions to find out what have you done? What do you do when you do on the weekend? Change the way the question comes out a little bit so we find out a lot more of what your child is comfortable with and telling us about. At home, we ask you to practice and develop skills with immediate feedback wherever possible. We want you to give your student responsibilities. We want you to allow them where appropriate to set up their own plans with their friends or with other kids in their class to maybe finish an assignment or work on a project. We want them to role play different encounters that could occur. We want them to have students order their own food, pay for items, ask for substitutions, no mayonnaise, Wherever possible, we want them to do things that they're going to have to do as productive citizens. We want, when it's age appropriate, have them make calls to doctors or other important calls with you right there because these skills are not inherent. We have to teach them. Wherever necessary, offer the scripted language. Allow conversations about difficult topics and have discord practice at home, which means if, if we're talking about a difficult subject like, hey, uh, you have three zeros in English, you're going to need to talk to your teacher about that. Pretend I'm your teacher and let them have the conversation. Let them get out their frustrations with you and then say, OK, how about we reword this like this? Or how about we think about this like this? Or what if we try this and then you practice that? And keep in mind that all students fail. Part of growing up is learning and experiencing and growing. And sometimes that means we fall down. Uh, that's a normal part of development. Do you have I completely that? agree with that. Yeah. Another thing that I've noticed that is a, a challenge for a lot of our students is when they go on interviews, if they have not rehearsed some of the typical interview questions for employment, even at McDonald's, McDonald's asks, what are your future career plans? McDonald's asks, um, you know, various questions about their schedule. They ask um, just, just general questions. And a lot of students really don't have anything in their mind prepared because they weren't anticipating those types of questions about their future. So just having those conversations and even doing that positive self-talk at home, which might not feel natural to you. Like, well, I got this done. Now I need to do this so that I'm able to do that this weekend. For example, I've got to go to the grocery store tonight and I need to mow the grass because if I don't mow it today, I'm going to have to mow it on the weekend and I'm going out of town. Those conversations you think may be very primitive and that, that children should just pick up on, they do not unless they hear that type of thinking. We've got to start talking about our thinking with our students um, so that they can learn how we make decisions. And just how we manage our time and how we prioritize different things. That is not something that's natural to students. 
um, no kid can, but every child is really going to prioritize themselves and having a good time. But if they know that the choice is, I can either have a, um, I can either get a solid grade on this assignment, or I can have a peanut butter sandwich right now. You know, they, sometimes it's not even things. They can't necessarily prioritize and they can't necessarily chunk it down into sections that make sense for them. So sometimes we have to walk them through bigger portions of it. And when I say scripted language, I'm not always thinking about writing something out. I'll give you an example. My daughter has some friends that maybe she might not feel so comfortable getting in a car with for whatever reason. Or she may have some friends that invite her to spend the night or go to parties that she doesn't want to go to. I have taught her from a very young age that she can blame me for that. And we have practiced whatever it is she doesn't want to do. She can say, well, I talked to my mom and she said no. And this is because. And of course, I know that my answer is typically no. Um, when she says, didn't I ask you? And that's just a way out for kids, especially when they're having trouble with the peer pressure. And we have practiced that because sometimes it's a very, very difficult challenge for them to say no to their peers. And at, at young ages, especially in middle school, kids ask other kids really random questions like, hey, I see you have $5. Can I have three of them? So sometimes it is very helpful to script things or help kids have fail safes to get out of difficult circumstances that they have practiced at home. That's just an idea for you. It may not work for your family, but there are lots of things like that that you can put in place to help make it easier for them to advocate for what they know is best, even if they're struggling. I think that's a great idea, Lacey, partially because I've done that same kind of thing with my teenage son who is 16. The one, sorry, now I'm the one who has a dog in the background. Um, but basically what's, what we're looking at is there are times when he's like, he's giving me the eye and I, or he'll even text me, hey mom, you know that thing we talked about? And then I immediately know that what he's really saying is I don't want to do this. And I'll pretty much come back with, you need to be home in about 20 minutes. How about if I come pick you up now? So something we have like some codes and some things that allow them to be able to deal with some difficult situations where they blame us because honestly, their friends don't care who I am. They don't, they don't care whether or not I'm net, mean and nasty. It's basically, it. they're like, oh, hey, your mom just doesn't do that. <laughs> yes, and I've also had very good success in my own personal life. In college, we had code words with, with our roommates. We had code code words with, with people we were going out with so that, that they knew like, hey, I'm safe. It's okay. Hey, I'm not safe. You can implement those things at any age and they're helpful um, in guiding you without embarrassing your student. And that's kind of where we're going with that. I think that's a great idea. So all right. one of the things that we know is that when our students do get jobs and lots of our kids get jobs is that they need to learn how to ask for that support. They also need to practice this a lot. Number one, they really need to not decide who should know that I might need to have a little bit of help or some extra practice. So you do not need to walk into an environment where you are working at your first day of McDonald's and tell every single person there, hey, I... I need help doing this, or I need, I get extra time to do this, or I do something. Instead, learning who gets to know and when it might be necessary to disclose a disability is going to be an important and difficult thing. Ask to speak somebody privately. We want them to practice this, okay? Um, they do need to determine when what is necessary to complete assigned tasks. If that means that they are not sure that they know how to break that down, they may need to ask somebody, what are the different steps? Do you have like a, a list that I can use while I'm learning? And a lot of places 
do because a lot of teenagers do struggle with this. But this is a skill that's going to go beyond just their first job. This is something that's going to be with them for the rest of their lives. If they start with it the right time and learning who to tell and how to tell and practicing this information, they will be so much more successful because the first time you tell somebody is the hardest time that you tell somebody. Later on, when you get a little bit more comfortable with it, it just works better. Okay. It helps you a lot when you're communicating with your supervisors about work rate work related concerns. You may need to practice this with them. This is not something that's going to just naturally come to them where they can go and say, I know who my supervisor is. I remember my first job. I could not tell you who my supervisor was to begin with. I didn't know who was the shift manager. I didn't know who I needed to go talk to and say, hey, I can't hear what some people are saying and I am hearing impaired. And I had to have that conversation. I had to figure out who I needed to tell that when you start giving directions, if you turn around and face in the other direction, I'm not going to hear you. Because at that stage in life, I didn't have hearing aids because they just weren't very good. So it was something that I had to naturally learn how to do. And my parents had to practice that with me a couple of times, say, Marta, what works for you? So, and for me, I had to learn that sometimes people were gonna have to walk up and tap me on the shoulder before they could start talking to me because it would make me feel more comfortable with that. Um, I also had to be aware and times when it wasn't always going to be possible that they were going to walk up and tap me on the shoulder. If they're having some sort of an emergency and you needed to get something right away, there's going to be times when someone's just going to be a little bit louder and say, hey, Mara, we need this. <laughs> and maybe they would talk to me a little bit louder about it. But we need our kids to be aware, reasonable, and flexible. The Job Accommodation Network is one of those pieces that will allow kids to kind of look at what is a reasonable accommodation, okay? Um, and then if they have that moment when they something is starting to overwhelm them, we want them to be able to take that deep breath, stay professional, focus on getting a work-related task finished. It is easier for kids from what I have seen, just both by observing my own children, observing children that I have worked with in a setting, is that when there is a paycheck involved in something, they are much more willing to accept the fact that you need to finish this task. You are much more willing to be able to accept the fact that somebody is going to boss at you and maybe even fuss at you a little bit, be able to do that, okay? And when you want to come back to that and recognize that you finished your first shift for the day, no matter how much that that feeling in your stomach was done for the day, you did it. The kids, I can do it. We've seen them do it. But now we need to be able to have them practice and then support them in their growth of that. Um, they see we have one using I can statements in here. I'm going to let you use touch on that one. So yes, um, I feel like when students get into difficult circumstances, they struggle with communicating um, supports that they need. So what they might say is something like, I can do this, but I'm struggling with that. That might be a good segue. The other thing that they, they would find um, success with is when they go to their employer sharing some of the things that they've found that they can do with relative ease before just jumping into, I have a disability and I need to just kind of massage that conversation a little bit, be a little positive, be a little upfront. I can do this. I am able to solve this. I need a little assistance here. Um, and that just helps employers to see where they're coming from. It's a little less um, intense. And also it helps foster relationships with their supervisors. I also want to point out here that the decision if to disclose and when to disclose are two different conversations we're going to encourage you to have with your student. Because in some cases, on some jobs, disclosing the disability is not relevant to the work that this child is doing. For example, if the student suffers from a mental health concern that is medicated and they don't feel like they want to share that with their employer, talk with them about the pros and cons of that and help them 
to work through the decision-making process. However, if you have a child and they have a disability that's going to impair their ability to complete the work functions, then another conversation should probably be had so that reasonable accommodations can be put in place. That's just a simple way to help you think about whether it's appropriate or not. And each person has to make that decision for themselves. I can't say to a student, and I never would, hey, yeah, you need to disclose this. Um, it's a very difficult decision for them. Some of them find it very embarrassing, and we want to honor their feelings while also trying to help them get the support they need. And I know I that there's a, that's a great point. And I'm going to give a personal example is that my older son decided he did not want to disclose that he was that he had a 504 plan with ADA accommodations that he was be able to use when he was taking tests in high school. He had that all through high school. He got to college. He was like, no, I'm not going to use it this first semester. And he never shared any of the paperwork. And that was a decision that he made. And at the end of the semester, and I'm mom, and I'm like sitting here struggling with him, watching him go through things. He was like, that was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. And I didn't do nearly as well as I probably could have done. And I said, well, we had to walk through that decision as to what do you want to do next semester then? How do you want to handle this? And we had basically ended up making that decision together that he was going to disclose to the college that he had an IEP, that an IEP had a 504 plan and that he needed to have his extended time. And it made a difference, but because he experienced what happens when you do it and what happens when you don't do it, he was actually a lot more comfortable and confident with his decision about, yeah, there are times when I'm going to need to disclose. He has not disclosed in his current job. I will give it from that one. And there are definitely some times when I've kind of said, well, you know, you can talk to them about this if you want. That's your decision. It is his decision that he does not impact him at the, his current job. So, and he's doing well, he's happy and settled, but it's a process. It, it certainly is. In the community, do you want to carry this one, Marta? Sure, I'll take care of this one. Thank you. So, um, I know that when we are, there's a lot of places that we go to in our community. You know, we go out shopping, we hang out with our friends, we go through community resources, meaning maybe we're getting on the bus to go somewhere, we're going to the library, hanging out in the park. Every single one of those places is going to have opportunities for our kids to be able to practice self-advocating, okay? Practice getting their confidence up and being able to engage with other people. Definitely want you to order your food in the restaurant. We need you to be able to disclose sometimes if you have a food allergy, or maybe you need to, to check in and ask the server, do you know if this has anything in there? Um, I, The day that I came back from a community trip with a student and the, the student had been, we were in a restaurant in the Ikea and he was looking at this one, this one chocolate bar and he was like, I really want this chocolate bar. And I said, well, that's your decision. You do need to check the ingredients. And he was like, oh no, I'm already looking at it. And then he came back to me later. He says, I bought this chocolate bar, but it has this thing right here. And I think that's nuts. And he couldn't, it was absolutely, it did have cashews in it and something that he was not allowed to have. So he actually advocated for himself walked back over to the cashier and said, I'm allergic to this. I have an open date. May I return it? His mother was so ecstatic over the idea that he did this, that he was able to advocate for himself and take care of something that would have been an incredibly deadly situation if he had opened up that, that chocolate bar and eaten it without looking. Um, so there are times when we want our kids to be able to ask questions from the people around you, but we also want them to recognize when not to ask. There are times when people are engaged in a conversation with other people, they're on their phone, and then walking up and tapping somebody on the shoulder just to start talking and asking questions it may not be that right time. Maybe they're engaged in something else and we want them to wait. We want our kids to see and learn what some of those visual cues are that somebody is not open and available to being, being ready to, to respond to something. 
Um, a lot of options within public transportation these days. Um, we have cabs, we have Ubers, we have Lyft, there are mobility services, there are buses, there are trains. We've got all kinds of stuff around. It is nerve wracking for somebody who is not familiar or uncomfortable to use that. So the best way that we can get our kids comfortable with using public transportation is practicing with them. That's going to be the best option that we have with them. And we want them to be aware of certain things when it comes to public transportation, such as the fact that if you are so zoned in on your phone and you're not paying attention to your environment in, on that bus, you're going to miss your stop. And there is nothing more frightening than missing your stop and then having to figure out how to backwards map to where you're supposed to be. So um, we want to know do you know how to react in the event that emergency happens? If you are involved in some way, do you know how to call 911? Do you know how to, to like make sure there's some basic first aid stuff going on, not to move somebody out of a car if they are hurt? Are you comfortable grocery shopping? Have them make our list. Make the list for the week of like five or six different things that they know are going to be like, and go with you. Let them walk through the process of being able to hand over that credit card or swipe and pay and bag through the whole thing. Do they know what their clothing sizes are? Are they comfortable with being able to pick out an act, pick out clothing that's number one going to be appropriate for the situation that they're that they're purchasing for, that it fits correctly, and that they have enough money for it? Um, when you go shopping for home products, whether it's a new lamp, whether it's bedding, we need our kids to be involved in these things so that they know what it looks like, so that they can make some choices about what they do and don't like. Okay, money handling is hard. You know, it's kid. I see some children who are wonderful with money and they know everything, and then they pull out a wad of bills, and I'm like. Oh. I want to gasp because we do know that there are people who are also watching our kids and making sure, what can I take from them? What can I get out of this? So absolutely, that safety piece is part of that self-advocacy, making sure that they know that where their money is and that they have it in a place where it can't just get picked up by somebody else or snatched out of our hand. Um, other one is time management. I think one of the biggest things that we're seeing in some schools these days is kids coming to school late kids arriving to school a half an hour, 45 minutes late because they missed the bus and they had to walk in. You walked in, fantastic. Was it safe to walk in? Was Were you in a position where you should have walked in or you should have called somebody? Okay. Do you, if, if you're running late from class to class, if you are constantly arriving to class as the bell is ringing, then maybe you need to stop and think about how does that work for me? What do I need to do? It is very different to be late to a class versus late to a job. Jobs are not happy people when you are not showing up on time. And that is one of the areas that is reported on the on the report card. And some some employers will look at report cards and they'll ask you for your report card and they will look at your absences and they will look at your attendance to see how many times you have been late to school. That does have an impact when you are getting hired for that things. Okay. Lacey had touched on this one earlier about how to say no. Being able to say no in multiple situations. No, I don't need to have another, another soda. No, I do not want to have that extra piece of pie that you're pushing on me. No, I don't want the upsell. No, thank you. Any way that you can appropriately learn how to say no is going to be beneficial to you. Okay. Um, but we also see a lot of kids who come in dressed not for the weather. There are times, you know, do, are they ready? Are they thinking about this? Do they know that it's going to rain later today? Do they know that they need to have to make sure that they have a heavy coat and a jacket with them on those cold days or that they're wearing layers and it's going to be 90 degrees? Uh, making kids aware of their environment and making them pay attention to it is going to be one of those ways that they will be much more comfortable in being able to say, yes, I have it great. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're all responsible for teaching these skills, right? Um, you can utilize younger siblings, older siblings, you, coaches do this, school support staff, friends, classmates. And our concern with self-advocacy, especially for students that we service, is that sometimes 
they end up relying on their friends and their classmates who also have not had much practice in self-advocacy. And it turns out maybe not as positive if, if as it would be if an adult had directly and explicitly taught some of these items. So just keep that in mind. There are some great resources on your screen uh, for you to get some more information. We always recommend the Image Center. We recommend um, the Parent Resource Center and the, the Vision, the Doors Office as a place to start. Um, additionally, we have this little video uh, for, for I'm Determined that we love. It, it runs about 10 minutes. So we're going to play this video. And then after it's over, we'll have about 10, 10 minutes for you guys to ask questions. Okay. Are you able to see the screen? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. be a self-advocate for me is to speak up for yourself and um, just speak your mind. It means being able to stick up for yourself and your needs and to be able to accomplish what you need to live in this world, in the community, despite having a disability, mental health challenge, foster care involvement, or anything else that could put you at a disadvantage. Me to, to speak up for yourself and, 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 and not be shy. The qualities that you need to have are knowing how to speak up for yourself, but for other people, but also getting to know them as well. What it means to be a self-advocate, to me it means being able to um, get help when you need it, even if it's something small. Like say, hey, um, I'm hungry, being able to ask for something to eat. That's one way of being a self-advocate. I advocated for myself in school and work by talking to bosses and teachers. I go out of my way to um, put my needs out there, talk to my professors if I need to, build up my speaking and writing skills, take the initiative to look for proper career paths and just taking initiative for what I need in general. I am a part of a Rensselaer County Youth Advisory Council that I am currently the president of. I also volunteer in other places where there's youth like St. Catharines, community hospice, places like that. Um, basically, I'm a part of a program, and I have my own apartment, and I have someone ch come and check up on me. So when they come, I basically tell them, I need like help with this, or I don't know how to cook this, can you teach me? All that sort of stuff. Don't be afraid to speak for yourself, speak up, and don't let anybody bring you down. Just keep yourself motivated and speak your mind. You need to be, in a way, determined or enthusiastic about what you're trying to do. Never give up, never stop fighting for what you believe in. You are strong. You are beautiful and you are important. That was actually much shorter than I remembered. So good. We have some extra time for questions and mm -hmm. comments. 
I was going to say, I know that one of the one of the resources that was popped up on the um, other thing was the Image Center, which is a group that you can connect with, so that if you have questions about the um, about where to go to get some help, some self advocacy, they do have um, the Image Center does have um, they have team groups and they have different groups and with that will address both students' interests and then talk about some of the self-advocacy that goes along with it. Hello, hi. Hi, welcome. Welcome, um, nice to be here. Um, so my son is Keith Smith, um, and he attends Woodlawn High School. I chimed in to try to get information about his, um, the resources you were presenting, advocacy, and being able to do that, um, Keith, independently, is a big, Part of trying to transition from high school he's a senior and um i've been trying to see about getting those type of um resources that you guys were going over and um especially the part that lacy spoke on about just them being able to communicate and be under understanding what they are speaking on and being able to speak up to different type of entities my son has a part of a selective mutism part of his diagnosis and being on the spectrum. And that has been a big thing, his whole um, educational and home um, lifestyle, part of his lifestyle and makeup. So it's always been one, him speaking up, which he's gotten better in some areas and, um, but still understanding what he's asking for is a big part of right now needing his support needing support for him in this transition because sometimes he's not aware of the material and things are being presented to him and he's unaware and too afraid to really get clarification okay um i am the transition facilitator and i sent some information to you recently and i i tried, tried to check in to see if you had received it what i would like to do is ask if you could send me an email and i can send okay. it and i can respond back to it my email address is e Mullen, and that's E M U L L I N at B C P S. And I think it's attached. I, got, I think I, I think it's attached still to how I got the link today. Um, okay. Uh, not today, but the link for this presentation that I got last end of last week to be a part of okay. this meeting. So I Excellent. definitely wanted to refer to your um, resources and see what we can do for Keith. It's just been um, hard mm -hmm. and trying to advocate for him. Some of the things have been like um, as much as trying to get him to be able to understand how to do things. One of the things you spoke of and you experienced with your son, I go through with Keith. Um, so that is just getting him to be able to say, I do need this support is a big mm -hmm. thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, what ha has Keith been through the doors program yet? No. no. Okay. I'm going to really push going through the, the, the pre-employment transition service, um, partially because self-advocacy is one of the pieces that they do and that they do have there. Um, there is a prod program that is called Project Access that's in, okay. it's in Howard County. Okay, so it's not super close, but a little bit closer because you're in the Woodlawn area. Um, right. And they will work with him on some of that information. So what I'll do is I will go back to the email that address that um, because you, since you received this link, I know that you've gotten it. Right. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and send some additional things. I will put in a, information specifically about project access because I've been getting emails from them left and right. Right now they are recruiting for a summer program that they have. That summer program is geared specifically for kids who want to continue their education and how right. to address some of those concerns. So okay. I think that that could be something that would be very beneficial to Keith. Um, I can also, um, when, when you and I email, we can set up a time to meet outside of the team. You do not have to have a team in order to meet with me. You can email back and forth with me anytime. You can also ask me lots of questions, ask me to call you, and we can do some brainstorming outside of that. I would appreciate that. I definitely wanted to set up a time to do that independently with you. Um, okay. Hopefully we can do that and correspond. I just wanted to really try to, I know the senior year is closing and it's so much that I wanted Keith to be able to have available and he wants to pursue that second level education with um, college. Mm -hmm. But okay. he also wants to 
um he's interested in learn i mean being able to have his first job so these are all things that he expressed to me for his independence it's just a lot of the things he relies on and me trying to get him to be able to advocate for himself is mm -hmm. still hard to transition um we're working on things some of the things you mentioned about getting and practicing and doing little interviews and things i've had to do with keith because he has been a part of like a lot of job fairs and um with one of the manage um management courses he has with miss hudson at woodlawn mm -hmm. um so he's been in different experiences at home to kind of give him like a you know uh interpretation of that but it's a lot of things self-awareness getting getting him to understand to speak up when something is a lot and one of the resources of his IEP and having the time extended time and needing calculators and things of that near nature I know he said one moment he says I'll spoke up for it and the next minute he said well I was afraid to say it in front of the class and the teacher was at the at the top of the classroom so I'm like you got to be able to stand up if you get you can raise your hand, but if you're not able to try to go in private when they're sitting alone and advocate that information for yourself, if possible. Okay. So, yeah, we still working with that. And I know he's going to need a lot of support. So I'm open to all options that are still presently available. Okay. All right. Well, I have some ideas about some things. I think that um, the idea of you and I meeting separately or just or at least speaking on the phone or meeting through Google Meet would probably want to be one of our best options. Um, there are certainly some ideas that we can do. And I think that um, making a referral to the DOORS program for the pre-employment transition services now, now is the time for that. Um, basically, what will happen is that once we make the referral, what I'm seeing when I make the referral is that I'm getting my parents or receiving emails directly from the doors program um, within five business days and then they're asking me they'll at they'll contact you to set up an appointment once they set up that appointment that appointment then is usually within a couple of weeks they ask me for a copy of the IEP and I can share that to a secure link that they have so that it's not being flying around in di inside of emails they have a, a website that I can go to that's secure and share that with them so I think that that's going to be what I really want to start with for him right now. And um, we can do that. I'll send you a couple of different things tonight. So, okay. I appreciate it. I was really hoping maybe we could schedule something prior because I know he has an upcoming IEP and I wanted to be able to talk to you and get some information prior to the meeting. Okay, I am going to be at Woodlawn High School tomorrow. Um, I'm participating in the um, mock interviews for the juniors there, but they end at 11 o'clock. If there's a chance that you wanted to come up to the school sometime around then after 11, I would be free. Okay, all right. Okay. And I just and want to thank you if for it's not on location. I'm sorry, if it wasn't on location, are you, are you reachable by phone around 11? Um. I am. I will give you my cell phone um, separately. I'll send that to you in the email. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And I just wanted to thank you for sharing. Sometimes it's even difficult to talk in these types of forums. So thank you for mm -hmm. that. Yes. Are there any other questions, comments, concerns? No, this is Kathleen. Yes. Yeah, hi. Um, I, I just am interested in all these uh, presentations. They're so good. My grandson um, is under my care and my son. Um, he's a little bit, well, he's definitely below the intellectual level that we're talking about here. But it's really good to know that you all are here and doing all this for these kids. Because when my boys were growing up and in high school, we didn't have any of this. <laughs> And all the information is so helpful. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Well, okay. I'm glad it's been helpful to you. So, it has. and certainly some of these, and one of the things that I've even had a, had a teacher ask me today is, you know, um, do you have to be under 21 to go through either doors or DDA services? And mm -hmm. I was like, no, 
No, no actually, those are lifetimes. Those are lifetime opportunities. So some individuals that are still struggling with a disability of some sort can go to the DOORS program as adults. They have separate programs from ages 25 and up than they do for students that are from 14 to 21 as their pre-employment transition services. And then they have the student employment services, which actually go up until age 25. And then beyond that, they have 25 and up. And then for our older folks, and this is one I'm even going to take advantage of for my mother-in-law because she's becoming visually impaired, is that they have vision services that are available to help with mobility and stuff. So DOORS is like a multifaceted piece to it. Oh, very interesting. That's good to know. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And we're glad to hear the positive feedback. Sometimes we don't get to hear it because we spend a lot of time uh, getting information out. So thank you for sharing that. Thank yeah. you so much. Okay. Do we have any other questions at this point? I think we're good. I want to thank you guys for spending a little bit of your precious time with us tonight to learn about self-advocacy and how you can help and partner with the school to make sure your student is as successful as possible. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We appreciate you coming out. Thank you. Uh -huh. Have a great evening. You too. Have a nice evening. Thanks again. Uh -huh. Okay. I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>